119. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way for the hand of God in my life I see. And the reason I'm a bliss, yes, the secret all is this, that the comforter abides with me. He abides, he abides, hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way for the comforter abides with me. My heart was full of sin, once I had no peace within, till I heard how Jesus died upon the tree. Then I fell at his feet, and there came a peace so sweet, now the comforter abides with me. He abides, he abides, hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the comforter abides with me. He is with me everywhere, and he knows my every care. I'm as happy as a bird of justice free. For the Spirit has control, Jesus satisfies my soul. It's a comforter, abides with me. He abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the comforter abides with me. There's no thirsting for the things of the world they take and wait. Long ago I gave them up and instantly. All my night was turned to day, all my burdens rolled away. Now the comforter abides with me. He abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the comforter abides with me. Yes, Lord. Number 147, 147. Christ coming now is nearing, blessed day of his appearing, this thought my heart is joyful. Millions around us dying for this, religious are crying, hasten, thy glory is coming, Lord. Jesus is coming soon, coming, I know, coming, his glory's bright to claim. With rapture's heart, we're waiting to join that grand translating hasten. Thy glory is coming, Lord. Sorrow and sin prevaileth in fear, the earth prevaileth darkness, abounds in every land. But in the darkest hour, he'll come in mighty power, hasten. Thy glory is coming, Lord. Jesus is coming soon, coming, I know, coming, his glory's bright to claim. With wrath, his heart, we're waiting to join, that precious lady hasten, thy glory is coming, Lord. So when the trumpet sounded, and he from heaven descended to claim, the church is called his bride. With boundless joy we greet, as we arrive to meet him, hasten, thy glory is coming, Lord. Jesus is coming soon, coming, I know, coming, his glory's bright to claim. With wrath and heart, we're waiting to join that great lady hasten. Thy glory is coming, Lord. Jesus is coming soon, coming, I know, coming, his glory's bright to claim. With wrath and heart, we're waiting to join that great lady hasten. Thy glory is coming, Lord. Yes, Lord.
Thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I know that a, a few of you that have, uh, <laughs> going to get emotional. Uh, a few of you that have uh, <laughs> spent several years together, um, back dur- dating back to journey days, and uh, that have witnessed these these little people that were up on stage up here, witnessing them from when they were <laughs> little babies, and then now they're up here praising God and singing. Man, that is uh, woo! It's dusty up here, a lot of dust. A lot of allergies and stuff. And then not only that, but combining more and more people together. And it's, it's amazing. And uh, man, uh, whew. Larry, we're going to need to get something up here. It's like dust. There's a lot of dust up here. Man, whew. yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome to all. Welcome to those joining us online. Uh, uh, today's message is going to be real brief. I'm hungry. And we have a potluck calling my name, so it's going to be a real quick, brief message. And so here it is. You guys ready for this? Do better. Do better. Do we have that? Do we have a do better? Okay, we don't have that up there. And the scripture reference is this. John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Okay, that's going to be our scripture. Jesus would not weep if you were doing better. So do better, and Jesus won't weep. Let's eat. Let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> and some of you are like, that's not even close to what that scripture means at all. And you'd be correct. Yes, I am joking. Hopefully you know that I am, I am joking. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's the thing is, is like, the question is, who really believes that's to be the message today? No, uh, I have never preach that fast before of course you know that and even if there is food involved I still don't preach that fast Uh, two that scripture is nowhere even close to the meaning and three there is always a meaning for the things that Jesus said and did and that's kind of what we're going to today that's what we're going through today a clear and simple teaching from Jesus and it uh, yeah thank you yeah glory yes and and Out of the uh, Gospel of Mark in chapter 9, Jesus asked a question, made a statement, and redirected the 12. And in my Bible, it calls the disciples the 12. So I like this. So he he asked a question, made a statement, and redirected the 12. And it's a little bit different. This This teaching that Jesus was giving, it's a little bit different because normally Jesus would would preach or teach in parables, Right? He would, he would do this, and, and we, could, we could look at this, the, the document on this. Luke actually has 24 parables in it. Matthew has 23 parables, and eight, or Mark has eight parables. And if you really want to get down to the totals, like 55 total recorded. Now, there are some that are similar or the same. So there's anywhere between 38 to 55 parables, in essence, altogether. So in all in all, Jesus did a lot of his teaching in parables. But in the 33rd verse of Mark chapter 9, it is interesting because this teaching is is really direct. And it still holds true today, I believe. So let's go to Mark 9, 33 through 37, where we just before this scripture, I'm going to kind of give a little like a little precursor to this, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the high mountain where Jesus was transfigured, and they saw Elijah and Moses. That was 9, 2 through 13. 
Then Jesus healed a boy under the, the power of a demon. This is 9, 14 through 29. Uh, and then, of course, we see this next prediction, Jesus' second prediction out of uh, 30 through 32. Ooh. But the scripture here, starting with 33, says this. They came to Caprina. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? Verse 34 says, but they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a child, had, uh, had him standing among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for your holy word. And as we break this down, Father, let our hearts be opened up to be able to hear your, your, just your message for today. Father, we thank you and we give you all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's take a look at this teaching. And what we're going to do here is I'm just going to just take, I, that's the full context and content of those verses, but, I, but I'm just going to take down what Jesus just said, okay? And we have this first part here, and this is my number one point. Why were you arguing about, or what were you arguing about on the way? So my question for all of you is this. Do you think Jesus knew already? Yeah, absolutely. I think he knew. I absolutely think he knew. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that he didn't know. And honestly, I think he allowed the conversation because he could have directed it, he could have stopped it, but he allowed the conversation to move forward. He allowed the conversation to continue. So we look at this. Jesus and, 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 and God, the Father, often asks these, these questions merely to engage in people and direct their attention to the issues or problem that needs to be addressed or corrected, right? Has this happened before? Yes. Yes. God did that to Abraham, or it, God did that to Adam and Eve. You guys remember that? Genesis 3 9 says, So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Do you think God didn't know where he was at? Yes, he did. Also see this in Mark 14, 37. It says, uh, when Jesus came and found them sleeping, he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? And I think about this, this, this statement here is, is, why or what were you arguing about on the way? And I think about this and I go, you know, why, why did Jesus even ask this? Why was this recorded that Jesus asked? And again, it goes back to is there's always a reason for what Jesus did. And there's an, always a reason why that was recorded. And that statement right there is, is a kind of a tr statement for us is, what were you arguing about on the way? What have we made important that we have to argue about, that we have some sort of, it's attached to our, our pride and our, and our dignity and our, our, our whatever it is. We, we, we start arguing, we start making that more important than the situation, right? So the question doesn't reflect the lack of knowledge, but provide an opportunity for, for, for others to take the responsibility for their actions. So when Jesus did this, he, he, didn't, he didn't really question their knowledge. He, he gave them an opportunity to Repent. Guys, one of our biggest lies we tell ourselves is God does not know. We think that God only sees us when we, when we want him to see us. Right? It's like imaginary door that we close like, okay, God, you can't come in here. And we hide here and do all of our bad stuff. And then when we're ready, we're like, okay, here, God, I didn't do anything wrong. Let me close the door behind me, and I'm good. See, everything, you know, you didn't see what I did. <laughs> but that's one of our biggest lies. And, and this is where it directs us also. What were you arguing about on the way? I find myself asking, 
what is so important to argue about? You know, and I think about that a lot. Anytime I get into an argument, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a man, and I'm flawed. I don't know if you know that. And because I'm a man, I'm a flawed, every little thing is attached to my pride and dignity and everything else. And so when I get into an argument, I'm thinking, you're attacking me. And it's not. But that's what I think. How dare you question me? That's what I do to my wife inside my head, by the way. Because I'm going to tell you if I did that, <laughs> she runs off to the shower and I have to sit there and wait outside until she's done. And then it's kind of like my, my time out period. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I did wrong. I know I did. But I find myself asking, what was so important about the argument? What did I need to be so right about that I couldn't just go, you know what, this really isn't worth it. This isn't worth the argument. What it's worth is, I hear you, and I hope you hear me. That's a lot of times what arguments even come from, right? But in, but in this regard, it was about a pride issue. It's about being right. And I think this is what Jesus really focuses on. Is it about being right or is it about doing the right thing? And I think that's what we have to ask ourselves. And this is what I love about Jesus' teaching here. This is multi, just a few words, but, it, but, it, but just in regards to what were you arguing about on the way, we can take that into our own lives and go, is it worth it? Is it worth me being right and losing a friend compared to if I just do the right thing and maybe we just walk along with each other and find out the answer together. That's more important. I find that in my relationship with my wonderful wife, that that's the important part, that we find out the answer together. And in my friendships, we find out the answer together. I find that so much more meaningful. And it's interesting is that's the same way I believe Jesus looked at it with all of his, not only his disciples, but with all of us, that we find out the answer together. Number two, as another portion of what Jesus said in this scripture, it says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. And this word first means more than just like the number, like, oh, I'm first place. What it's really meaning is, and we, we see that as more of a ranking structure, but, and then we see that sometimes as, a, as an honorary, but in this case, that, that word means like, the, like, the, like they're looking for it as to be the chief disciple, like to be the, the main hot show, to have that wonderful title, like, I am the best, I am the first, I am the greatest disciple ever, right? And we see this is, is this is the connection here is what, you know, whoever wants to be first, because this is what they were arguing about. The disciples were thinking of a position when the time comes that Jesus would take his earthly throne. They still believed. They, they, they understood and started recognizing that this, this man named Jesus is the Messiah, or at least they wanted that to happen. They wanted that to be true. They wanted Jesus to be the Messiah. And what they wanted, what they wanted, was that Jesus was going to come into their throne and kick the Romans out and be able to have peace on earth forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's what they believed. They believed that this throne was an earthly throne that Jesus was going to take up. They believed that that, they almost probably, they wanted it so bad because they wanted it to snub everybody else that called them lower than low. You know, think about it. Who did Jesus call? God, Jesus didn't call these, these high Pharisees, these, these, these lawmakers. He called a fisherman, several fishermen actually. He called a tax collector. He called a man that was going to betray him. He called these people. And it's interesting to me that their take on it was they were going to be high and powerful in an earthly throne. And Jesus was setting up a throne so much greater, and they couldn't see it. And this is what I love about what this here is. 
If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. And I like this, is, and I, I read this, and I'm quoting this out. Jesus told them that they would have to lay down the right to their lives and be willing to die for him on a cross. And I think about that, and I, and I love this. They would have to lay down the right to their life. And I think about that, guys. That's what, honestly, God is asking you. Are you willing? Are you willing to give up the light, the the right to your life? You know what the difference is. That is, is is your obedience compared to God's obedience. What I mean by that is, is I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to be first. I want to be served first. And so today when we see in potluck, we're going to find out who the eyes are when they go first. <laughs> Nobody's going to be in line. We're just going to be sitting there like waiting, like who's going to be first? No, but, but in this regard, sorry, I kind of went to the side note. We're coming back. Here it is, is the <laughs> lay down, gosh, to lay down the right to their life. To lay down the right to their life. And I find that so interesting to me. But we but see, this is the thing is, is Jesus talked about this already. Let's go back to Mark 8. Mark 8, Mark 8, 34. And it says this: calling the crowd along with them, uh, uh, with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Remember what I was telling you, lay down the right to their lives. Follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We also see this out of Matthew, Matthew 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. It says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. <laughs> Again, remember I was talking about this earthly kingdom that they, were, he, they believed he was establishing. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you, able to, are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Guys, I, I like this lay down the right to their lives by, by, uh, and be willing. This is a, a sense of being a leader. And honestly, I've never even thought about this before, but the, but the right to your life as a leader. And what I mean by that is being a leader is not so much as following some sort of uh, command itself but there's a burden that comes with every type of command. There's a burden that comes with every type of leadership. And you may be going, well, pastor, I'm not a leader. I'm telling you, if you're speaking the word to God into somebody's life and you're trying to follow them and trying to help them and trying to lead them, you are now a leader. And, and with that even being said, there are people that are actually in positions, positions as being a leader. And guess what? That means you are a leader. And that means you don't have the right 
to privacy anymore. You don't have the right to say, well, this is my time. And that's so difficult. Believe me, from the position that I have, it is so difficult. And I'm telling you, as anybody that takes up a command, it is so difficult because it's no longer about you and it's about everybody that you are in charge of if you want to be a good leader. Now, you could be a dictator, and that's not a good leader. And you can issue out your commands and believe people are going to do them, and because they should, because you're leading off of some sort of fear, which I'm thinking about establishing. But with that being said, if you are truly wanting to be a leader, then you have to forfeit, to forfeit the right to your lives. And that's hard. Guys, it's easy to have leadership and prosperity and the power. Guys, that looks so different, right? When everything is going great, it's easy to be the leader, right? But when the problems start happening, when the issues start coming up, and, 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 there's, and there's problems after problems and after problems, and those difficulties, and especially if you look at it like some sort of persecution or, or dangers or hardship, guys, that's when the leadership is, is it's at the hardest but the purpose of leadership is to equip and encourage others so they remain steady and effective in times of great trial. Humble yourself and prepare yourself that it is not about you. I think when you become a leader, maybe it be a you're leading somebody in the gospel. When, you be, when you're leading somebody in their life, and, and guys, I'm going to let you know, I, I think if you have ever discipled somebody, if you ever walked beside somebody and discipled somebody, have you not noticed that those are hard times too? I find it to be where you almost, you almost have to get worse. It's going to get worse before it even gets better sometimes. Humble yourself and be prepared that it's not all about you. Lead those that don't know the way by serving those that can't find the way. So then Jesus comes back and refocuses his disciples. He says this, whoever, number three, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. You know, the thing is, is the 12 were waiting. The 12 were waiting for Jesus to, to take over his earthly throne, like I said earlier, to kick out the Romans and establish his kingdom. And, 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 they, and they began this, this worthless argument on who was going to be greater and better in Jesus' kingdom. But Jesus tells them, Jesus tells them that their perspective was wrong. And he says, a leader doesn't speak, excuse me, a leader doesn't seek power. Or his own glory. A leader seeks ways to help and protect those who have no power. That's interesting to me. A leader tells that their perspective was wrong. He says a leader doesn't seek power, fame, or his own glory. A leader seeks ways to help and protect those who have no power. And then he continues on in verse 42. He says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You know, it's interesting about what really sin is. We use the word sin a lot, right? Oh, that's sin. Oh, that's sin. And we can look at the Bible and we got examples of what sin is. And we know it. And, and there's, a, there's a code, you know, in a sense of if we know what sin is, we, a lot of times it's a, it's a violation of our own 
or a heavenly code, right? Like something that we know that we can't partake in. And we know that. We can't, we can't indulge in that. And because of that, we know that to be sin. And that might not be everybody else's in, in regards, but for us, that was a violation of our code in a sense. That God has talked to us. The Holy Spirit has convicted us of. But then there's also the, also the actual true code of what God says, this is sin. Look, this is sin. But it's also kind of means more than that. It's just not a bunch of rules. Sin is the active way of drawing yourself away from faith. Sin itself draws you away from faith. That the sin that you partake in starts chipping away at the faith that you have. But look at this, even, even after being told, and this is what's so funny to me, is, is like Jesus just got done telling them, hey, look, uh, these little ones, they're important, and if they're coming to me, you need to do something about it. Like, this is a good thing. You need to bring them in. You need to make sure that they stay true to, to the teachings that I'm teaching them. And then he says, hey, look, if, it, if, it, if you do something bad, and, and you know, it pretty much is like, hey, if, if, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, if you cause one of these ones to walk away, then he's like, look, it'd be better if you were have a heavy millstone and we take you out to Cheney Lake and dump you in there. I mean, Cheney Lake, you probably only get like, like about a chest deep in it. But nevertheless, I mean, that, that's literally what he's, he's saying. It's, it'd be better for you to be thrown in to the water and drown and die than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble, to cause one of these little ones to walk away. And I think about this because literally within a couple of verses, Mark chapter 10 we see this. People were, uh, 10, 13 says, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But, his, but the disciples, <laughs> but their disciples rebuked them. Then G when Jesus saw that he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of of God, like a little child, will never enter it. After taking them into his arms, he, led his, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Guys, I think there's a, a true warning that we have to look at as a church. Where does our focus lie at? And guys, let me tell you, it, it is a hard ministry. Children's ministry is probably one of the hardest ministries to do in the church. But at the same time, is it's not just about some sort of ministry program. I'm talking about how you live your life. I will tell you, my children learn more about Christians by the way you act than they will ever learn about Christians in this book. Think about that. Your children will learn more about Christians on the way they act than anything in a book. Now, what I mean that is I'm not putting this down. This holy word is holy, and it's powerful. But it's what you do with this holy word in your life is what changes it. And I'm not telling you you have to be saint-like, but you should be striving to be saint-like. You see what I'm saying? I'm not telling you you have to be perfect. There's only one that's perfect. But you should be striving to be like Jesus. Guys, this is a warning on how we deal with children, what we say around them. And I'm going to tell you a little fun fact. It's also about new and young believers. What I mean by that is there's actually Scripture all over the place that even talks about that, that we as these young people need to be. Just like what we read here. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child would never enter it. I'll even say it this way. These young and new believers, they have a childlike faith and it is so delicate in this moment. We 
as, as Christians, as, as Christ followers, should be looking at that and nurturing that and, and growing that. Because if not, and we treat them like the world, they're going to say, well, what's the difference between the world and the church? And I'll answer it for you. Nothing. But I think this warning, and, I, and I, I found it very interesting. And me and Darren were talking about this this morning. I was a little bit, and I was kind of talking to him. This was, why a heavy millstone hung around the neck and thrown into the sea? Jesus didn't just say things just because. Like he didn't say, well, I'll just put him to death. And it, it, every meaning, every type of death in a sense would have meant something. If Jesus said, well, he should be hung up to a tree and, and he should be hung from a tree, he should be, he should be crucified by, uh, on a tree, he should be chopped, you know, his head should be chopped off, he should be stabbed to death, whatever it may be, whatever de- de- definition you were looking at, every meaning means something. And I think about this. If he was to be thrown over, and think about you, if you were to be thrown over because of something you did or said. And I think about this. Like, there's three different things that I think of. Like, for one is this, the fading light from our eyes as it gets darker and darker. Like, if, if we were destroying these baby Christians, either being children or young believers, and we were just telling them, you know, just destroying their faith because of stuff that we did or the things that we said or the things that we were just ridiculously doing or even speaking the word untruthfully, and, and we look at that as, like, that is what we would see as we were wanting to go into heaven, but as we were fading away, we were looking into, from darkness looking up, never being able to see, receive the light. Number two is, no matter how hard we fight, we keep sinking. How easy is the gossip train? How easy is it to become negative? How easy is it to become internally angry and hateful? And it's like a fire that never gives up, right? Right? It's a fire that's inside that it just feels like it just keeps getting putting logs and logs and logs on it, right? Or is that just me? Are you with me this morning? Come on now. I'm talking about anger, gossip, and any of those things. Those things that just really burn inside, that just start just eating everything, every good thing, every good thing that happens. When somebody does something good for you, like somebody gives you a box of chocolates, you're like, why couldn't they give me their good chocolates? Oh, I'm not good enough for the expensive stuff? When somebody gives you M&Ms, and you're like, but I like peanut butter M&Ms. And that person's like, well, next time I do it, I won't think of you. How about that? You know, it, it's these things that we, we, we look at, and, and the anger just starts just creeping out and starts spewing over, and it starts going. And no matter how much we fight against it, it just keeps sinking and sinking and sinking us. And number three, if I think about it like this, for the destruction of young ones. I even think about it this way. What if the line that you're tied to, this rock, only puts you about an inch away, the water? Meaning that you were so close, so close to receiving life-giving breath, but it was only an inch away. We talked about the depths sinking down and fighting against it, but I'm thinking if you are literally looking up and you see that there's only an inch between your lips and precious life-giving air, but because your toxicity and your non-repentance that you cannot reach that top and grasp life-giving air. I know that's heavy, and I don't expect an amen. Okay, wow, that was really deep too. Whoa. <laughs> but I think about these things, guys. I think about these things because I, I think about where we're at as a church, where we're at as a congregation, where I'm at as a Christian. Do you think I don't fall or fail? I do. I do. But it's how you get back up is the most important part. 
I love the fact that the Bible still shows and gives us application to our lives. Guys, I, I, I believe this. I, I believe that this little, this, little, this little directional change, you know, this question, this statement and directional change that we see here, I, I believe that it is still awesome that how God still talks to us, that can still work through us. And not only that, but we, we start getting to see that all these other things kind of even get in the way of our own Christian walk, our own faithful walk. And I mean by that is we can get caught up doing church work, right? We can. You know, running a ministry, feeding the hungry, working on the ground, singing a song, preaching the word, checking statistics, uh, managing finances. All these things can become, you know, we're, we're like, oh, I'm working for the church. I'm working for the church. I'm working for the church. And it's like, God's like, yeah, but what about this relationship thing that we were supposed to have? But God, don't you see me? I'm doing all this crazy stuff. And he's like, who are you again? Where did you go? I can't find you. But we so get so caught up, and guys, don't get me wrong, those things are good things. Those things are good things. The ministries, the, the, the finances, doing all that stuff, there are things that we have to do, that we need to do. But we can't get caught up. We can't forgo the message of what Jesus was telling us. Look, it's about those lost ones out there. You're so worried about the position you're trying to hold, that the position you're trying to take, the position that you're wanting to do, you're so worried about that stuff and you're not worried about those people outside. Guys, I think the message for us today is why are we arguing over something so pointless? Don't you know the humble servant lays down the right to their life for the kingdom because there is so much more than a position or title it is to lead and love those who need help finding or staying on the path to Christ Jesus giving up our desires our attention our selfishness and our focus and focusing only on Christ Jesus and the byproduct of Christ Jesus is all these other wonderful ministries and things that you have going on. But the focus and main attention should always be Christ Jesus. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That is the greatest command. That is the greatest command. The greatest command is and make sure your ministry is doing great. Make sure people are attending. Make sure that you're getting tithes and offerings from everybody. That's not, that's not the greatest mission. Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor. That's what you will be judged on. That's what Christ is going to ask you when you go to heaven. Did you love God with everything? And did you love your neighbor as yourself? He's not going to ask you how many people attended your ministry last Sunday. Let us pray. Father, just thank you so much for everything you have blessed us with. And Father, as we continue on with our day, our night, Father, just ask for blessing. Father, I'm asking for blessing over the meal. Father, I know that there have been many people that have put hands on the meals today. And Father, I'm just asking for blessing over that. Father, I thank you for all the people that have, that have offered up a, uh, a food sacrifice to all of us hungry people. So Father, I'm thanking you for that. And then, Father, I'm thanking you those for those that did not bring. But Father, I am asking that those people that did not bring still be here today in fellowship with us. Father, I'm just blessing everybody. Asking blessings upon all of our people, our food that we're about ready to eat. Father, just thank you for that. Father, I know this is a difficult message. But Father, I feel like it's a message that we have to evaluate every single day. Every time we indulge ourselves with an argument of some sort. Father, let us look towards it and go, is this worth it? And then let us redirect our time and attention to what is worth it. 
not only here in the church, but wherever we may go. Maybe it be in our family. Maybe it be around our friends. Maybe it be even around our co-workers. Father, let us just find that greatest love that is you, Father, that we love you with all our heart, all our soul, our mind and strength, and love our neighbors as ourself. Getting rid of our pride and our frustrations. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we give it all over to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Guys, please, 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 if you did not bring something, you're like, man, I didn't bring anything. Maybe we should just go home. I'm going to tell you that's the wrong, wrong answer. I made two huge dishes of, ma of uh, not macaroni, of spaghetti. I have supplied enough spaghetti for a, literally an army. So because of that, you are more than welcome to stay and eat and fellowship with us. And if you